Reese, welcome. We're in London, mate. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Your story is one that I've known about, yep. that I've heard about, but I thought during the month of November, Movember, and all the hysteria that is around that, and it's great hysteria around men's mental health, but also physical health. Yeah, It's been in the pipeline a while, so I appreciate you making the trip across yeah. from Wales. My pleasure. And I did wonder where to start this, right? I thought, mm -hmm. oh, we could have a general conversation about the demise of Welsh rugby. We're recording just after Wales got beat by Georgia. And I thought, no, we need to hit the millions and we need to hit the masses with the punchline. Yeah. Can you just take us to 2012 and then we'll unravel stuff yeah. from there and we'll go through the archives and stuff, but just hit the listeners and the viewers yeah. with that day. Well, it was um, 26 January 2012. I literally uh, was in the gym at Parky Scarlet. I was in my last year contract. I was like in my last six months. Um, I I was it was just after the Christmas fest uh, um, fixtures, so I was just in the gym. I had, I had bulging discs, C one, C two, so I was just uh, having a bit of a downtime. So I was just doing an interval session on the bike, just a standard forty five minute one, nothing major. Just it was your know, typical like we had the Wednesday off, Thursday morning in, just doing a little blow, and um, I was just sat next to Morgan Stoddard, just on the bike doing a interval session, and just literally had about five minutes to go, and bang. Just massive heart attack, and got rushed from the the gym. Um, you know, I was conscious the whole time. I managed to like walk across the gym. Well, I like I was stumbling and I was like super dizzy. Uh, I knew I was having a heart attack because I had a smaller one in two thousand and seven. So the pain was the same, just was a bit more intense. And I went into the physio room and I like, said, "Pat, I think I'm having a heart attack." You know and um, he called the ambulance and then I like, I just went down the hall because I didn't want the boys to see me. Like, you know what it's like, you know, a bit of ego and pride at the time, you know, what show weakness. Uh, so I went down the corridor and, and just kind of lay down. I was struggling to breathe. I was like sweating. and like It was all a bit hectic, really. And I was like, oh, come on now. You know, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. The ambulance came and they, they literally rushed me up to Morriston. And they did an angiogram on on the on the slab where they just chuck this thing in your in your in your vein like a cath, uh, catheter and then they put this wire across your heart um, into your heart. It was uh, called the angiogram. And yeah, they confirmed I was having another heart attack. But I was like, oh, you know, at the time I was stressing out. I was looking at the doctor. I was like, listen, buddy, I'll be all right. Okay, I said I've got a big game, a couple of weeks. You know, I think I'll be okay. Or and then my pain just got worse. And then from that point, they literally they just pulled all the stuff out and said, we need to take you for a bypass. And I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what a bypass was. And uh, yeah, they ushered me into another anaesthetist room where my wife and my father-in-law were waiting. And I just like saw them, was like mega scared, crying. And, you know, I told them my wife I loved her and told her to tell the kids I loved them. And then literally they um, hit me with the general. And um, I woke up then a couple of days later and my life was completely changed jesus christ i've yeah. heard the story yeah. i've read the story <laughs> but being here yeah with you now and you telling it it's wild mm. wild i mean a heart attack yeah. how old were you 29 jesus yeah and what was it like i know you kind of said that you were conscious and mm. one of the things that i read you say was how painful it was now, some people think heart attack, bang, you just drop down. Yeah. I saw something about Glenn, Hoggle, uh, Glenn Hoddle when he was at the BT studios. That's what happened to him. Um, but I've not heard about someone having a heart attack, one at 29, mm. and also been able to walk to the physio room and say, look, something isn't right. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, cause obviously, it was it really painful? Yeah, I mean, I've got to be honest. The one I had a smaller one in 2007, and they called it a... a, a a, di a dissection spontaneous dissection uh, so they basically said it was a, a split in my artery downstream and it caused a clot in my heart so it was like a one in a million but that pain that I had that day in 2007 was was much worse like I, I thought I was literally on the way out and I couldn't literally couldn't be feel like someone was standing on my chest I was literally vomiting I was ripping my clothes because I couldn't breathe and I thought oh, I'm gone like this is the end but the one in 2012 wasn't as painful, it, although it wasn't nice. It was they, it was never they were none of they were never pleasant. But I I thought to myself, ah, oh, you know, like I'll be okay. You know, I'll just have another angiogram. They'll clear the clot, 
and uh, I'll be back. And that's what I thought, right? Because I even had my phone on me. And when I was in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, I was ringing my wife saying, Paula, you're not going to believe us. And she was like, why? She said, I'm having another fucking heart attack. And she was like, fuck off, Reese. I was like, no, I'm not joking. So she was like then hysterical, obviously. And um, the mad thing was I'd signed my critical illness on the Wednesday on my day off and my, uh, because I, they wouldn't cover me for five years because of my first heart attack. But because I've been playing pro rugby for five years since. No way. Aviva uh, took me on, but they wanted to do a medical. So then my medical report came back on the Wednesday and my accountant was trying to come to the house. But I said, it's my day off, bro. I'll come in town for a coffee and I'll come in the office and sign it. And obviously I went in Thursday morning, not even 24 hours contract signed to incident. And my, my, I had my heart attack. So when I was in the ambulance, I was ringing my wife. Just not to tell her, like, you know, I'm, everything's okay. Just make sure you ring fucking Mark to tell Make sure we're insured. <laughs> make sure we've got the life cover. There's a payout coming, said, maybe. No, no one's going to believe me. Like, you know, it's not even 24 hours. Um, oh, they, my God. Yeah, bro. And so, you were covered. Thank fuck. Had he come to my house, like he was asking, it wouldn't have been because they needed the CCTV footage of me going in the office um, to make to know that I went in and that I had signed a date. And thank God they did. So um, I was so lucky, bro. And uh, the only regret I had, mate, is that the morning of the heart attack, he said, just before I send it off, do you want it four and four, so critical in life, or two and two? And I was like 29. I was like, just do two and two, bro, two and two. And I never even played a month's installment. So madness, bro. Insurance, eh? When you need it, <laughs> when you need it. There you go, listeners. Get yourself some insurance or hopefully... The people listening and watching this won't Especially go Especially rugby that. players. Well, absolutely. So you go in to the hospital. Yeah. You don't think it's as bad as the one in 2017. You think yeah. potentially you're going to be all right. Yeah. And then at what point are you thinking, holy shit, like I'm struggling here. You mentioned mm. you told your wife you loved her. Yeah. And did you know at that point you were going to have surgery? No, I didn't know what a bypass was. So I thought like they're just going to go in and like just do a little, you know, little tweak up fix it up and then send me back I genuinely didn't think it was the end of like I didn't think I was gonna I was scared whether I thought I was gonna die or not or whether it was the end of my career I wasn't quite sure I was I was obviously scared I was crying and you know it was, it was scary shit but um the when I realized that it was something was really bad was obviously when I woke up post-op and uh yeah that's <clears throat> it was that was just when you knew it was I was fucked. Why? Yeah, I was so fucked. Why? What happened for you to realise that? Because when you have an operation, when you play yeah. rugby, you're a bit out of it anyway. You feel a bit sick. But uh, when you wake up, oh, when did reality I just, hit? I was so ill. I, I literally, I felt bad, you know. Like, I would just lay in the bed. But I was very lucky to survive. First thing the surgeon said was, it's a miracle that you got through that operation. Because when we opened your your chest and pulled your heart out, your, st your sternum, he said he was literally removing clots of blood like worms with his fingers Jesus. and he didn't think that I was going to make the op so um thankfully like I lost the the, the only and th thankfully I was alive and he said if if I wasn't in the condition I was in physically I probably would have died but he said that that had left the heart in a shit condition so like I'd lost over 50 percent of my my heart muscle on the left side and um my heart because my heart was so weak when it came when I came back around um that they had to inflate this balloon. So they like put a, a balloon up my groin, which they put up next to the heart and they pumped it up so that it took the strain off the heart beating. Uh, just so that first week when I came round, I had to lie on my back the whole time. I wasn't allowed to sit up uh, and I was super nauseous, but I wasn't, they were like really didn't want me to be sick because of the stress I would have put on the heart. So they would just hit me with all sorts of these different drugs, bro. And I mean, they were so strong. And like, so one was hallucinogenic and I was just like, dude, I mean, this was the wrong time. I mean, this would be great any other day, <laughs> <laughs> but right, right now I'm not in the mood for this. Um, so, but then eventually like after that week, uh, surpassed and I couldn't sleep cause I, every time I shut my eyes, I would just, um, I'd wake up like, <sighs> like I couldn't sleep. So I didn't understand what this was. Um. And then the nurses said, oh, it sounds like you've got like a little bit of anxiety or it might even be having, you're having a panic attack. But I was like, what is that? 
I had no idea what that was. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, well, what do I do? I'm like, I just want to sleep. I haven't slept for like five days. And they were like, well, just sleep. And I was like, well, no, I can't. Maybe when I shut my eyes, I wake up like, like, like I'm scared or whatever, you know? So that was a disaster. Like, that was a nightmare. And then when I got home. I how long until you got home? So how like, long were you in hospital for? A week. For? Only a week? Yeah. And, but, but I literally, I'm not joking, Jim, just to walk from here, like for 10 meters, just to my toilet would take me three stops because I'd go like three steps and I'd be like, <sighs> like I'd just done like, you know, some sort of fitness. And um, that's when I knew, shit, I'm fucked. Mm. Proper fucked. And did they tell you at the hospital, you're very lucky. At that point, yeah. did they say your career's over at 29? Oh, they didn't even talk about the career. Okay. They, they just said, you just be, just be thankful you're here because... Uh, it was a miracle you survived, really. And then that's when I just went home then. And that, that as my physical health kind of returned, because it never really did, I always had that shortness of breath, <clears throat> especially upstairs. I couldn't even walk. I, just to go to bed at night, I'd have to have like two or three pit stops. And I had one flight of stairs, mate. And I'd have to sit on the top step when I got there. Like, it's only like 12 steps. And I'd have to sit there. <laughs> Just to, and then I just to walk to my bed. I sit on the edge of the bed, and then like I couldn't lie flat for the first couple of months, so I had to sleep with pillows under my back. Oh, bro, it was it was awful. And then whilst during that period, dealing with the fact that my career was gone, and that was just it was so bad. It was the most awful thing ever. It yeah. was yeah. I mean, you know, when it ends, it's never great anyway. Well, there you go. There's us moaning and worrying about transition. I know we're all in our own little bubble, but listening mm. to your story, why I wanted to bring you in because of that, and that's why I wanted you to start with that. <laughs> and then we'll go through some of the other stuff. One of the things I wanted to ask, you had the one in 2007. Yeah. Then we know there's a number of checks now. Were you getting yeah. checked after that regularly? I mean, I was going up the hospital from time to time just to have like an ECG and seeing my cardiologist to give me, because they wanted me on medication, like they wanted me on beta blockers, and I think I was on aspirin. But you know what, it's, I was on beta blockers and trying to play. So, you know, it's bringing down my heart rate. I was struggling to get my second win, especially after half time or any long breaks. And I was just like, oh, dude, my conditioning wasn't peak. I didn't, I certainly didn't feel like it was. So I struggled on those beta blockers post, post op, but, and the same time, he was like, well, for a start, you know, heavy drinking, smoking fags, you know, the occasional whatever social activities you're getting up to, you know, maybe you need to knock that shit on the head. Well, not maybe. Like, that needs to stop. And it did, like, for a while. Don't get me wrong. But you know what it's like. You're out with the boys. You know, that three or four pints became seven or eight pints. And then back to... You know, God knows how many pints plus shots and doubles and and before you know it, mate, I'm just back in the groove. Mm. Do you think? And this might sound an obvious question, but I don't mm. think I've quite heard the answer. Yeah, genetic or lifestyle or a bit of both that caused you to have a heart attack. Well, this is the mad thing, right? I had no underlying heart disease. I have no previous uh, family history. I um. There was nothing that they could have indicated that it was like they didn't say that. Obviously, the lifestyle wasn't. It wasn't. Obviously, it may have been excessive in part, but it wasn't like I was drinking seven days a week. You know, I was only drinking weekends. It was just after Christmas, though. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> most weekends, but mostly at Christmas. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no. So it was it was a strange one. I personally. I think it was a combination. I did, when they actually opened my chest, because that's the only way they could actually see what was actually going on with the ticker, was that on the left side of my heart, I had thin artery walls. So they said, you know, they weren't sure if that was genetic or something that was over time deteriorated. But they said that wouldn't have helped with obviously the impacts I was having, with the, the, the physical exertion that obviously it takes to be a pro, all that conditioning and... Uh, but as well as that, the stress, like, you know, that emotional, mental, physical stress that I was putting myself under just by, you know, doing the things we do on the weekends. Listening to your story now yeah. and 
not knowing who you are right now, but having an understanding of what you've been through, it would mm. naturally change anyone. Yeah. All the thing that comes with gratitude, being present. Mm. I spoke to my mate Ed Slater, who's battling MND and mm. everything around his story, and he talks about being present. If we go back when it was all glory, professional athlete, professional rugby player playing for Wales, were they wild times? And I know you've spoken yeah. about what it was like and being a rugby player, not just a rugby player, but for Wales, yeah. is slightly different. When I played for Scotland back in the day and mm. going to Wales after an international and Gavin Henson and yeah. Hookie and Lee Byrne and Andy yeah. Powell, it was fucking wild. Yeah. Do you know, it was. It was what, like, you were rock stars, yeah. absolute rock stars, and we were on the coattails. Like, that was it. <laughs> what was it like then? Was it, is it, you know, was it a case of... Yeah. Was that every week, at every international, yeah. like you got a taste for it? Yeah, I mean, we were in, like, I think, quite a unique squad at the time. Because like you said, Gav was probably what, like one of the first rugby superstars, right? And um, we had, a, we had a, a mixture in the squad of, you know, real top quality, like British Lions, but they all loved the social. And then when Gats came in, I mean, we were always mad on it. I mean, look at, at the coaches we had prior to Warren. It was, uh, you know, obviously Steve, but then Hans, Steve Hansen left. But then, you know, when you had, we had Gareth Jenkins. And I like, you know, Jippo loves, he loves the piss, right? Yeah. He loves it. So, you know, it was probably a little, I mean, <laughs> it was a little unprofessional just of the month that we were, there was no balance. But you were winning things as well. Yeah. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Obviously, so, besides the 2007 World Cup, which was a disaster. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> obviously, 2008, then when Gats came, was like the scene changed. But then he still gave the boys license. You know, he said, like, if you want to, you know, you as long as you're winning and you within reason you're doing things and you're keeping accountability, like player-led accountability, within reason, it's fine. But I, I can assure you, when we were winning test matches, we were going out afterwards. Did he know how wild it was? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I can tell. He you, will do now. I could. <laughs> yeah, the boys were mad. They loved it. They were. They were mad. I, you're yeah. not just saying. I'm telling you now. I and it isn't for me to talk about like, what lads were up to, yeah. but it was wild in Cardiff. It was. I mean, Cardiff is wild anyway. I mean, they love it, right? It's one of the most passionate rugby countries in the world. And after an international day, seventy thousand people are pour out of a stadium, and they are on it. And then you'd go roll out into Cardiff in your black tie, post-match. The king. Literally, like, working class Reese from Joburg, king of Cardiff. VIP, red carpet, free booze, you know, people offering you things, drugs, whatever you want. There's you know, women throwing themselves at you. Like, you are just like, you're like a kid in a, kid in a sweet shop. Mm. You just can't believe what's happening. And, uh, yeah, it was crazy, right? I mean, it's just, you can't imagine it. No. And it was something I struggled with, mate. I struggled to turn that off, if I'm honest. You know, um, that little bit of recognition and little, that little bit of fame. Oh, it's nice. Yeah. When you, you, look, Smooth the ego. Exactly. Like, you're a professional athlete in one of the toughest combative sports. Yeah. You're winning things. That's what it is, isn't it, as a young man? And this is one of the things... One that I try to contextualise, like being a dad now, just turned mm. forty. I know. Yeah. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I know, I'm Jesus the same Christ. Age, <laughs> well, there you go. Like perspective, and but even for me, I go back to it. It was always different in Wales and Cardiff, and Gavin Henson was the lead in charge of that because yeah. of the profile around him. But that era that you had, it's I've had a bit of it in terms of profile, mm. but for you lads, very different, right? So when mm. you talk about. I don't know how much you're willing to share yeah. of your story. I'm sure yeah. you'll share the lot. Mm. But you mentioned alcohol. You mentioned drugs there as well. Yeah. Like how prominent was that for you in in, in your prime as, yeah. a, as a player? No, I mean... Or did that come after? It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't. No, so, like, when, obviously when I had my heart attack, I was fucked. You know, there wasn't going to be no drugs then. Yes, no cocaine there <laughs> to raise the heart rate up. Yeah, there's no, no bag with the ticker in the state it was in, I mean. But, yeah, I mean, different times, you know, there was never any times that during the, my, like, the weeks or anything like that I was ever drinking or doing drugs, you know. I wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I think people miscontextualize what I'm saying when I talked about it in the past when I said I did, I did do drugs at, at points in my career, and I did, you know. But it was only over on the weekends, and, you know, it wasn't ever, like, problematic. It wasn't like I was on it all the time, 
but it, it obviously it happened. Do you know what I mean? It, and it, and it's it's hard not to to get into that. But we were getting we would we you know we getting tested all the time, even with Wales. You know, with that that testing protocol that we had then was, you know, it was strict. Like they wanted to know where we were every morning for three months, and we had to go through it. And if we left where we were supposed to be for that time slot every morning, we had to text to a number. And oh, it was uh, Adams, WADA. Yeah, yeah. So they had that to dope in stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I missed a couple of tests. Not, yeah. on, but I mean, just because, as you Same. know, my admin's awful. Yeah. But yeah, they're strict. Yeah, dude. I, I'm a, I missed one on my honeymoon, but not because I didn't say that I was. I went on my honeymoon. And they rang, um, my team manager rang in the hotel and um, said on my honeymoon, uh, I, sorry, one of them water people rang me and said, where are you? And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm on my honeymoon. Yeah, he said, we came to your house this morning and you weren't there. I said, yes, yeah, because I'm on my fucking honeymoon. And he said, yeah, well, that's your second missed test now. If you miss one more, it's an automatic 18-month ban. Did like, you tell him you were on your honeymoon the first time as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first one I missed, I think I was actually in the house looking out the window, but uh, a bit sketchy. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, listen, it wasn't all that bad. I mean, but it was, it's, it's hard to turn it down, Jim, at the same time, you know, it's... Uh, but that was life, you know. That was the that was the, the the place we were in. That's that's what the path had led me down. Because when I heard what happened to you, mm. and people were like, "He's he's wild yeah. on the piss," yeah, and he's one of them. I like wild people. Well, I, I love yeah. wild people, right? Yeah. So it's the characters of it, and mm. I know some of that can be an alter ego sometimes. And I've been there before. Like you, yeah. you've got to play up to it. It's like, that's the caricature that you become. Yeah. Was that you all the time? Was it just more and more and more? Yeah. I think, unfortunately it, I kind of got taken away by it. You know, I, I kind of created that identity, I suppose, if you want that within that group of so many characters and personalities and, and egos in that squad, you know, like, how could I be seen, you know, or, like, have some, you know... Point of difference. Yeah. So, for me, it was like, you know, how much of a, an arsehole could I be? Or, you know, how, what r ridiculous thing could I do? You know? Because, I mean, obviously, you, you're competing with some pretty big big dogs in regards to... I mean, Powerly with a with a golf, golf buggy is going to... It's a hard one to beat. <laughs> you're going to struggle to beat that one. But, um, but, yeah, that was kind of it. Like, so it was just... Drinking until a point where I didn't really have any idea what was going on. You know, I was getting pinched quite a lot. Um, but you were getting off. Do you know what I mean? What do you mean pinched? Like getting locked up. Oh. Yeah, pissed up. Cause I pinched? Was, yeah. You know. <laughs> locked up for what? Pinched for what? Just, just being steaming, just being an arsehole, breaking things and like public uh, damage. Just things that, oh, you know what I mean? It was I was off the fucking rails. Mm. And... Um, and they'd like yeah they'd nick, they'd lock you up they'd put me away for the night and then but because I played rugby they'd let me off in the morning and it was just like Phew, I'm untouchable yeah. that's what it felt like do you know what I mean Did no one pull you aside any of the lads any of the yeah. coaches were they aware <laughs> yeah, of Yeah no I mean I, everything Yeah I mean I got locked up in Italy right and that was kind of the like I'd been locked up the weekend before for being an idiot in town uh, with my brother and then my missus then my ex missus then said to me like if you do that again like, if you get nicked again, you're gone. And I was like, okay, I swear down. And then I went bloody out the next week to Treviso on tour with the Dragons. Ended up um, going out when they said we weren't supposed to go out, just me and my mate, and then got absolutely blotto in some nightclub. And then my mate put the head on on a copper, and it was just absolute bedlam. And um, ended up going in jail for three days in Treviso. Jesus, what was that oh, like? I was fucking... It was awful, mate. It was my first, like, it was December. We were playing hiding cap, the back-to-back, -back, like, you know, the same fixture back-to-back. -back. And it was Treviso away, then home. We beat him away. And then we got pinched out there. And um, they wouldn't let us go home. Like, I just thought it was all oh, good old, you know. We'll just be ushered out in the morning. because we Welsh home. legends. Yeah, like, they'll just let us home. Of it, like, like, it always happens. And I was even like going, I got a photo of my one of my teammates who came in and get, get me out of there. Took a photo of me with, I was about 20 stone heavier, mine, with going like this with my fingers to say like, give me my phone call. Because I wanted to ring my missus to say, or my ex to say I wouldn't be coming home. That didn't happen. They said, you're not in America, bro. 
<laughs> and, <I was> like, <laughs> and that was it. Like I got, um, yeah, it was awful, mate. It was, it was, and I mean, it cost a fortune as well. Like they, they did me for half a month, uh, uh, package, pay package, uh, all the damages for solicitors. So, I mean, it was awful. There was just shit. And then we came back and, you know, it was in the press everywhere because I was with the Welsh squad. They said I did all the things that my mate did, uh, which wasn't true, but it just looked better in the press. And obviously my kids were in school, so it was like, it just wasn't great for them, you know, as a whole. And uh, it wasn't long after that, mate, the Welsh management, like, you know, we, we got nicked again then in Cardiff on a, after we played Scotland, I think, on the Sunday, we went out all day, and I think Powerly, Bernie, um, Mike Phillips, um, Hugh Bennett, me, John Thomas, we all went out, and it was just like we ended up getting it made the it made the papers, and then I we all got in trouble for that, <clears throat> but obviously they all played, and I was twenty third man, and so, it was you again, yeah, so like they were just like, oh dude, you know, you know take your time's come and gone I think yeah you can see and I can level with you I've been on the pine I don't know if they call that the pine I've been to prison <laughs> I, I've been locked up a few times as well when I was younger for mm. a lot of fights mainly yeah. on the piss you're thinking you're King Kong when you go out yeah exactly. um, grew up in a rough area and only recently again reflection having children mm. going through life experiences and actually went to Bar Linney, which is a famous prison in mm. Glasgow um, the Lockheed Bar Lockerbie Bomber was there. That's the profile of jail. But wow. there's murderers and yeah. there's paedophiles in there. There's everything of everything. And I went in there and gave us a, a, a talk. I say a talk. Mm. I went there and spent the day. And I could see the prisoners in there when I'm talking about playing in Heineken Cup finals mm. and playing in World Cups. And one of them like just got up and walked out. Yeah. And then one of the prisoners said, oh, yeah, he's heard it all before. And I, and I tried to find a way in which to level with them. Mm. And I just said, like, I didn't want to say I could have, could have been you, mm. but I kind of could. You know, you, yeah. life goes in different directions. And one of the things I spoke to them about was the fact that I didn't have a dad growing up and my father was vacant. The minute I said that, these young men, mm. bang, eyes locked on. Engaged. And I had a, a, something that they had or a void mm. that they had. I'm interested to know about your background. Is there anything like that that mm. caused you to behave the way that you behaved? I know you went to boarding yeah. school. I don't know whether that has. I've heard that people from boarding school, especially yeah. me mate John Barkley went to boarding school. He's weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anything like that in your family that, that life or your growing up? Because And the reason yeah. why I'm asking that is because people will be listening mm. to this and the other things that we can get to around addiction, drinking problems, yeah. gaming, gambling. There's yeah. so many vices, isn't there, that people have. Yeah, sure. And you can sometimes look back and be like, well, this is the reason why, because my dad weren't there or because mm. um, of where I grew up. And everyone can have an, an excuse, but listening to you and maybe a little bit mm. me as well in terms of my background, it doesn't necessarily need to be a background. It can just be one thing that takes you off the path. I think it was a multitude of things, really. You know, I came from a really social family, Jim. So they they loved socialising. We had a big family, you know, so tons of aunts and uncles and it was party for everything, you know, like party, party, party all the time. And um, in many ways, I think I was accustomed to it. So, you know, alcohol and partying and getting bladdered was just something that I saw and was the norm. And it looked fun. It looked great. Like they're all having such fun, so I thought, oh, this is this is this is you know I can see me I can this is I'm going to mold into this eventually, and then obviously you start playing rugby, you go to boarding school, and I, and you know my boarding school was was amazing. This my school I went to was <coughs> incredible. <clears throat> I mean it was hard, um, you know it, the prefects there used corporal punishment and you know. Those those five years I spent, you know, the first three were were tough, bro. What does tough mean? I went to a rough school. I say a rough school. Yeah. That was tough. What does tough mean in a boarding school? What does corporal punishment mean in a South African boarding school? Yeah, so like, mate, you know, so obviously the corporal punishment was illegal, but the the prefects, you know, someone forgot to tell them that. So obviously when they locked the gates at night, the masters, the the prefix were looking after us. So we were in dorms in our first year, dorms of up to 16. But then when, when you go up to your next year in school, 
you, there's like dorms of four and you stayed in dorms of four then um, as you went up. But obviously on, the, on your wing in the, in, the, in the hostel, there would be prefects that were in a singular room that were to like look after that wing of students. And there were rules, right? The lights went off at 10 o'clock at night. And if you chose to talk after lights out, which was, you know, against the rules, there were consequences. So your consequences were either you write school rules or you wake up uh, early and do early morning report in your school uniform. Like, say, if you've got to be up at uh, 6, 5 o'clock, you got to knock his door, he comes and says, all right, and you're not allowed to sit. You've got to be fully dressed in school uniform. Like, things you don't want to do, right? But obviously, you know, you're in a room with four mates, like four of your best mates. You know, you, you've had a day in school, you did banter, you, you're whispering. But these guys would just bust in and they knew. The rules were clear, right? You're not allowed to talk. So if if you didn't own up for talking, they just punish all of you. So like honesty was one million percent. So <laughs> they'd say who was talking and you'd just say it was me. And then they'd say like sometimes it was optional. Like, you know, have school, they'll just be pissed off and say, just do school rules or do early morning report. Or they would say, like, have a lash. And, um, yeah, so they would have their own sticks. Some had, like, hockey sticks, some had cricket bats, whatever it may be. And, uh, yeah, they would give you a lash. And, um, like, you know, it, it, it fucking hurt. <laughs> what can I say? But, obviously, the more it happened, the more conditioned you came to it. Like, my ass was like leather in the end, right? I mean... One of the the students that was above me, I mean, he double stepped me with a cricket bat like in front of the whole prep room, smashed my ass, and it literally was black and blue. And but I didn't, I didn't even flinch because I was just used to it. I was conditioned to it. Are they laughing when they're doing it, or is it got to, yeah, the, or is it like serious business? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's all like you know, light hearted, you know. It was well, all I've like, never, I've never been whacked on the ass with a cricket bat. <laughs> <laughs> Hockey sticks, coat hangers, like. Poles, you name it, bro. So, yeah. But, I mean, so that was tough, right? It was tough. But that was life. And so I, you just got on with it because sometimes I didn't want to write school rules, Jim. Like, that took hours, bro. It, it wasn't what I wanted to do. So, like, if there was an option, I would take the lash because mm. it was much, you know, I, I, I broke the rules. And I, you know, if they gave me school rules, I was gutted. I'd take the easy option out every time. So, I, you know, I had a, a challenge in... A, you know, that's those school years. But I loved that. I was like a big sleepover. Best friends, like rugby, the school. I didn't like, you know, ac the academic side of the game, but of the school. But anyway, it helped me. And then I left and I came over to the UK. And I think, you know, being, you know, rugby allowed that environment didn't it? to drink, to be a lad. To, you know, it enabled all those types of behaviours. And, um, Constant stories, yeah, banter when you're coming in. Yeah. yeah, people just making fools of themselves 24 7. Like, mm. we're always someone to laugh at, right? So, you know, obviously, when I came to the UK then from Wales, uh, from South Africa, I was on my own. My family my, left my best friends and my family behind and came and stayed with my half brother. And I mean, it was cool. I was ex It was nice to be a new country, a new challenge. You know, I wanted to try and play for Wales. And, but at the same time, like there was no support from the club, you know, I was, I just was on my own. I never had any mentorship, and there was they had such an easy opportunity to do that. They had like Gary, uh, Gary Teichman, Percy Montgomerys, Adrian Garvey's. Like there were tons of South Africans at the club that they could have just tagged you on, but they didn't. So like I don't, I mean, I'm not. I'm just highlighting some issues that were glaring through my life. Well, as a young man that comes in, that is <clears throat> got a wild. Yeah. streak in him exactly when I was at Leicester they saw that in me yeah. and Dean Richards and Richard Cockrell mate they saved my life yeah. by putting me on the straight and narrow not whacking mm. me on the ass with cricket bats and hockey sticks but <laughs> punching me in the face with a fist I don't know what's better but <laughs> but, both. Yeah, but we, you see now the amount of kind of external and mm. internal I know a lot of clubs have psychologists and stuff like mm. that for maybe different reasons the social media part of it but also I don't want to say pressure, but it is pressure of mm. fame and being a young man, early 20s, mid 20s, mm. and you want it all. Not all, not yeah. everyone wants it. Mm. I look at Lewis Rees Summit now. Not that I'm worried for him, yeah. but I'm like, you've got the world at your feet. We saw it with Gav mm. Henson, and it's like, I hope there's someone with him, especially yeah. because it's Wales. Mm. And the way that he looks, his yeah. profile, 
been on the wing, all the things he's that pretty. go with that. He's pretty, yeah. and he looks like he likes <laughs> the excitement. I saw him wearing like a linen suit or something in yeah. Monaco, it might or Dubai. It, who knows? Yeah, good on him. But you do hope that that's there. Yeah, just exactly. trying to look through the the, the pipeline then. So you, yeah, you play for Wales. You're in these wild kind of party yeah. days. And then at the point of having this big heart attack in 2012, mm. where were you in your life there? So you're married, did you have children at the time? I did, yeah. And I mean, it wasn't plain sailing, bro. You know, my, my marriage was volatile at the best of times. You know, my wife was with me whilst I was playing for Wales. And she knew that that what what that environment was like. Like she, you know, she came out with us on one of the nights post-match in Cardiff and what came with that. And she was just like... She couldn't believe it, obviously, mm. you know. So it was, yeah, it was crazy, mate. It was, it was, but she was understanding too that, you know, I was just this working class boy. That's all I've ever, ever wanted. And then all of a sudden it's on a platter. Like, so she was, yeah, it was tough. It was tough for her, bro. It was tough. And um, I had kids. And obviously, like I said, it was I had two stepkids because from my wife's first marriage, she was 10 years older than me. So um, they um, they were in their teens when I was playing for Wales, but my younger two were like just babies, you know. But obviously when I when, the, when everything was good, all good, but then obviously when I started getting, you know, in trouble and getting locked up and all the, all the press that came with that, like it was shit for the kids. Do you know what I mean? No two ways about it. And although it was like banter, oh, he's done this again, he's done that again, and... Yeah, it was painted as that. It was, it was shit, you know, for them. And then, um, yeah, by then, by the time it came up to the, through that, it was a lot of stress on our, our relationship with my ex. And just before I had my heart attack, I pre-contractually agreed actually to move to Biarritz. I was going to, I signed, I uh, pre-contractually agreed a three year. Oh, lovely spot as I well. I know, mate. I was gutted for months after my heart attack, about that in particular, mm. just because I was looking forward to the lifestyle, right? Yeah, man. A little, a little espresso and fag every morning. Mm -hmm. mm. But, um, yeah, and then it, it, it wasn't to be. But, you know, that sucked. That moment sucked, um, knowing what I had upcoming. But also, you know, at, at my relationship was rocky. It was probably on, my wife wasn't going to come with me to France. She said that straight up, my ex-wife. So, you know, things weren't rosy. And, like, I was living to excess. You know, I, there was, and it was always on, like, pressing, pushing the boundaries constantly. Pushing, pushing, pushing. And that had consequences with also the club. And there was, it just got to the point where it was, it was almost, it was becoming unmanageable. <clears throat> and um, that wouldn't have, you know, no one would have said I had a problem. But it was just like it was the joke. It was like, oh, Stinky's at it again. Because that's what they used to call me. <clears throat> Do you think when you had the heart attack then, mm. people wouldn't have been surprised? Even though, say, we we now yeah. know, or you now know, or think it could mm. be genetic. Some people listening to this might be thinking, fucking no chance, it's lifestyle. <laughs> but when yeah. people heard that you've had a heart attack, and when I heard you had a heart attack, yeah. and people were like, oh, he's loose as a goose, steroids yeah. got thrown into the mix. Yeah. It's always the first. Thing. Well, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah. You can clear that up if you want, because I yeah. don't think it is that, is it? No. But everyone was shocked. Yeah. But it was like, mate, fucking wild man. Yeah. Hell, of, mean, a hell of a life, up to 29. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, listen, I shoved as many uh, years as I could into 29 as possible. Um, but yeah, no, never steroids. I mean, I was kind of, I had that fear of, you know, I don't want to be caught for doing that. You know, I don't want to take something that's going to enhance performance, you know, I can take the casual shit, but we won't do we won't do the steroids, you know. That was yeah, that was always a bizarre one for me. But yeah, that was that was like one of the questions I would always ask first the doctors, you know. Did you do steroids? No. Have you done drugs? Yes. How much? This. All right. It's not that. I was like, oh fuck. So there was all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, it was it was it was that on and off the pitch. But again, like I said, it wasn't like I was drinking midweek during before games as such but it was come weekend you know the wheels would come off you know royally come off if i played friday night it was friday night saturday night few drinks sunday in monday then but the diet wasn't great because to allow for that drinking yeah you're eating crap like i yeah. i got that weigh in on monday bro you know what it's like and if i come in heavy I'm oh getting, so you're not eating well i was just eating like uh, zero carbs mm. it was just meat on a plate so your body was constantly in oh, shock yeah dude, i mean it wasn't great I yeah. think that didn't help either. 
What I wasn't aware of, and this is probably because I hadn't heard too much about you, apart mm. from that you're all right, that you're going to have a heart transplant, which is not yeah. all right, really. It's fucking shocking when you hear it. Yeah. But I didn't realise your life spiralled out of control after that. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that until mm. recently. So what did happen? The Beeritz thing, as we know, didn't yeah. happen. You retired. You were insured. Was that a good thing or not? It was. <laughs> Getting a payout. Yeah. I didn't get a payout. I got that shepherd. So it ah, was, okay. It was ongoing. Um, thank God. If I didn't have taken that out on myself, I took it out for my toe because I ruptured my plan to play. And I thought, you know, I got a couple of years over in France, last two contracts. My trot is not going to last. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get in, take the insurance out on myself. And then, you know, if I have to finish the game because of my trotter, you know, at least I've got shepherds in place or whatever. And then literally a couple of months later, the gripper. So, yeah, so I mean, it did. That's what happened, mate. Like, obviously, when I lost the career, my, my health was buggered. Like, I was stuck in this really strange place, Jim, where I was, I was in my mind constantly, where I was, like, constantly looking back to the past. I had so much guilt, so much shame, so much remorse, like, running through different scenarios, what could have been if I hadn't done this and that, and... I wish I'd applied myself a bit more. I wish I hadn't, like, just non-stop. So lifestyle regrets. Oh, so Are much. Are you thinking, like, oh, because I've gone out and done this, I've done this, that's why I've, this has happened? Yeah, like, but as well as that, like, thinking of how I could have done, like, differently, like, how much more I could have reached my potential. But all that did, bro, was just bring me so much low mood. I felt depressed. Um, but equally, then I was, in the same way, I was thinking to the future, and I was just thinking to myself, like, oh, like, what hope is there? Like, I'm fucked. I can't even, like, I can't run. I can't even walk 20 meters without being completely out of breath. Like, what is actually, what, what hope is there? And then in the same time, thinking about what could have been with, Fro like, being in France. Being, with the Express being on huge. With, yeah, just lo living life. Like, you know it's what I mean? the ultimate. Gun bleeders on tap. Yeah. And um, I don't know, mate. It just, just. Yeah, it just hit me like a, a brick wall and I was absolutely nowhere. Like that physical battle from that heart attack completely became a mental battle at this point. Mm. And I was just eating myself alive with this thought patterns. And um, I was just in such a shit place. Um, and then in 2014, I got, I got offered an, like, well, actually in 2013, I got told I had, because I felt so bad. I, like I literally, I couldn't breathe. So I went to the doctor and I said, this can't be right. I said, like, I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, I, str I can't breathe. And he was like, we'll send you for a heart transplant assessment in Birmingham. So I went up to Birmingham to the Queen Elizabeth and they did a heart transplant assessment. And there they told me literally, you're not leaving the hospital and you need a heart transplant, like straight away. So I had to ring my mum and dad. My mum and dad came over from SA. <clears throat> and then they, while they were doing all these tests in the hospital, obviously this has come as a surprise and they give you this little book. It's about that thick. And they tell you, um, read through it. And I called it the book of death because it, it was just like 120 pages of just how you're going to die from a heart transplant. I actually just binned it. And I was like, I'm, I'm not reading that. Like, that's too much for me. And then um, literally my last, one of my last tests I had before my, to go in to wait for my transplant was, uh, it's called a right heart catheter. So they literally just go through your jugular. And they go into your heart. You can't. You're awake when they do it. They just put a bit. Of, they put a bit of local in your neck. Just a bit. Yeah. And um, they tell you. I, I, they told me I had pulmonary hypertension, which basically was the pressure between my heart and lungs was too great, so I was untransplantable. And that was it. Transplant was off. Fucking hell. And my mum and dad. I remember looking at them from where I had the, the in the in the in the cath labs. I saw that my mum and dad and my and my ex sat through the way in the waiting room. And when I knew that they said I was untransplantable, I got wheeled out and I saw them. And I was just like, oh, I was, I was gutted, bro. I was so gutted. And um, they they said, oh, well, we're going to have to reassess now because, you know, we can't do the op. But our options are pretty limited. So I said, okay, well, what? I said, I don't feel great. Like, what's the deal? They said, well, we we need to get it done quite quickly because we think that roughly, given your state of your health and your heart, you've probably got about 12 months to live. So I was like right I said okay so I mean it's pretty urgent right and they were like yeah so I was like okay so what's the option so then we went home obviously I cried like the whole way from Birmingham to back to Newport just drizzling 
obviously. Well, I and, could imagine. I could yeah, imagine the just, stress. Oh, fuck it. Heartbroken, right? And then about a, a couple of weeks later, take back up to Birmingham and they said, oh, there's this machine we can implant. It's called the left ventricular assist device. It's basically a pump that they put in your heart that sucks the blood out of the left side of your heart and then it pumps it back through a tube that's connected to your aorta. It's uh, a set of batteries. It's, it's battery to run or in the nights you plug into the mains and there's a wire that comes out of your stomach. And it's called uh, you know, this left ventricular assist device. And, and it, what it can, can do in time is reduce pulmonary hypertension. And um, it'll, it'll make you transplantable as well as it can give you a better standard of life in the, in the meantime. So at this point, I was like, well, I'm 30 years old. I've got a young family. Like, obviously, I don't want to die. So I'll have the machine, right? So they had to get permission because they were in England and it's not a heart transplant clinic in Wales to get the money funded from the Welsh NHS. So six months, I'm still waiting. And now they told me I had 12 months to live, right? So I'm just at home shitting myself every day. Like, you know, come on. Like, when am I going to hear the news? I'm on the phone to the hospital, my GPs, nothing, nothing, nothing. Eight months, nothing. I'm like, this is a joke. Like, and I'm ringing the hospital that we still haven't had the funding from the Welsh NHS. In the end, I was just like hysterical. I rang the hospital. And I said, like, "Come on, like, please, you know, like, help me. You know, I've got like supposedly four months left of to be alive. <laughs> it's like, can I have this machine or what? Thank God it all got sorted out. And because I was like, my health was not great. They sent me into Birmingham, and I waited in hospital there in the coronary care unit, the CCU, and I stayed in that CCU unit for six weeks pre-op. And, mate, it was just the worst thing I'd ever experienced in my life because it was about 18 people on this ward in Birmingham and they were all, like, people that were literally on death's doorstep waiting for heart transplants or had just had huge heart attacks or, or on back end of surgery of quadruple, you know, bypasses, stuff like this. And um, I was just waiting in there. There was no Wi-Fi. There was no natural light, not a window, just the top row of windows. And um, you, we could only go out every other day if the nurses were available because there was uh, two, bursas, two, two nurses to each patient in there. And um, literally every day, at least one or two people on this ward would die, Jim. Well, you're at the doors of death there. That yeah. is literally it. And I'm literally sat there, machine flat lines, the nurses run around, shut all the curtains and then paddles. But you know, if they're fucked, they And then, yeah, curtain back. thing... Uh, if they they can tell if he's dead or not, or whether the machine beeps, right? And then they get, and then when they die, they'll wait. They'll come in. They a guy puts them in a body bag and off they go. But like sometimes the families were there, so then you'd like there was a young girl that was in the ward next to me, uh, not in the in the bed next to me, and she died. But her family were there, right? It was awful, and they were all crying and oh mate, I was just like I was. I said to the nurses like, please, can you get me the fuck out of here? I mm. said like, I can't, I can't deal with this. This is too much. I said there's people dying here every day. Like I'm not that bad, and they were like, no, 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 you're in the right place. So eventually, like thank fuck, I got out of that place and went in for my op, and um, like that place gave me some serious lessons though, Jim. Do you know what I mean? At the same time, like I knew just how vulnerable and how fragile life is and human beings are. But then at the same time, like I was watching people die and get shocked like t two, three minutes later, wake up and then walk past me like to go for a piss <laughs> and having a chat with them. And I was just like... All right, still... <laughs> you're right. You speak to anyone on the other side, bro? Yeah. It must be like you're in some... Fucking simulation. It was, and there was no Wi-Fi, no natural light. no. And there was three tellies on these wheels. And like, you were, just, you were in the list. So sooner or later, they would die or go for their heart transplant. And you would, the, the TVs would get passed down. So it wasn't long until you got one, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ, he's gone. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Old Jerry, you know, he's gone. Can I have his telly? And um, no, but like, it also showed me just incredibly how, you know, how resilient human beings were at the same time. It was like a paradigm, right? So when I left there, I was super grateful. Straight in for this op, had this machine implanted. I don't know if you've seen it, like the wire comes out my stomach. Well, I saw you've got some funky bum bag on. Yeah. I was going to say it looks, I mean, it's in. Yeah, my little fashion. My so little fashion. Talk, us, talk us through that. I mean... Do you want me to show yeah, the camera? Yeah, go show, show, show the camera. Where's Let's have a look. There? So I think you're, yeah, that one there. So yeah, so basically the, it comes out of my stomach. 
like that. And then in my little fashion, my little fashion man bag, there's, this is like the machine. So this is the batteries that keep me on. They're just lithium batteries, last eight hours. You can see like, I'll remove, it looks like a little, and it'll be, so. Um, well, don't be taking that out then. <laughs> yeah, so these things keep me alive, bro. And without those batteries running 24 um, seven, yeah, I wouldn't be here, simple as that. And um, in, the, in the evenings then I unplug from those batteries and I put, um, and I put, I, I plug into the mains. It's like a little machine by my bed and um, they, it runs off that. And um, so it's got a long wire, about two meters long, so I can get to the bog. And so, yeah, so obviously you can, I had that operation on the 1st of September, 2014. And I didn't wake up post-op for two weeks. I was in a coma and again, super, super lucky to, to be alive because they really struggled to make, uh, to get into my heart. Cause after my first operation, cause it was an emergency, they just kind of got into the, uh, my chest as quick as possible to do the bypass. So there was a hell of a lot of scar tissue. So they couldn't actually get to my organ. It was just like a spider web of veins and arteries. And it took hours. I was in the, I was in the theater for literally hours and hours. And um, they were going to abort the mission after six hours because they couldn't actually implant the pump into the side of my heart. Um, but eventually, thank God, it took three of the heart transplant surgeons all working on me at the same time to make the hole in the left side of the heart to implant it and insert the cannula. <clears throat> so thank God, you know, I did. I woke up two weeks later, but bro, I mean, that two weeks hours of sleep was just the most horrific ordeal I'd ever been through because it felt full... Like I was in a nightmare for years. It was just like an ongoing, never-ending nightmare that I was in in my mind. And you could feel that when you were asleep? No, I was in it. Like it was real. It was like I was in a different life. Yeah, that's what I mean. So you with yeah, because you have heard of stuff like that before. And I've listened to podcasts yeah. where people talk about they go through experiences like that. And yeah. the scene from Gladiator, you know, where he's walking through the field and he's touching it and it's like the door to heaven where his family are right. and th there's a few podcasts out there there was a rich roll one with a guy who was a runner and he explained it unbelievably well to the point where it felt really it, weird yeah. like, as in listen to it's it because he made it sound so real yeah well like as i see it now i think because you're sedated right i was awake in my op because twice now I've seen myself in my operation on the slab, two different occasions. One with a uh, with a treatment that I've done recently in a ceremony, and the other um, with within my, within my nightmare that I had, where I was on the table and I had my whole transplant team here. My chest was open; they were plugging away in it. And to the right, there was a whole different team. They were like all uh, from a different hospital. Um, and if I'd went to that side, if I touched, there was like this little dude doing this like kind of prayer type thing by me, like a hello, hello. And I, the, the, my nurse said, if you touch him, you'll go that side. And I, but I touched him and they went, did you, did you just touch him? And I went, yeah. And then I woke up in that hospital and I was walking around Fuck, yeah. and I walked out and then I lived a life there. I was in. How was it? Mental, bro. I mean, I had different buddies. I was driving around and I was like in a taxi. I got locked up there. Uh, same of old course, shit. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, same old shit. reliving your good life. Yeah. So yeah, it was crazy, mate. It was awful. And um, when I woke up, because every time they tried to wake me up from my coma, I was just super violent. Like I was just literally just swinging. And on in thank God in Birmingham they got they got a military ward, uh, a wing. Yeah. So they were using military nurses to light me in the end because like these little poor little nurses were trying to wake me up, and I was just like. Argh. Um, but thank God I woke up and, uh, but then because of those nightmares, literally, um, if I heard like an echo or a certain scenario that would remember me of those dreams, I would just go into the most strongest panic attack, Jim, like deep, like I thought I was dying. Like another well, I, attack. You can imagine. Yeah. Having a, I've had one before when well, I, had, well, I had a panic attack when I, it was concussion, but yeah. I didn't realize it was concussion at the time and I had a panic attack because I felt really weird. Yeah. And the first thing that happens is your heart races. Yeah. 
So you, you must have been shitting yourself. Yeah, I thought I'm, I, th I thought I went numb. My face was like pins and needles. My tongue was like so felt you thought swollen. That, so you thought and my chest. I was, I was like, and I couldn't speak. And I was like, oh, I'm going. I'm dying. And I got taken to the hospital in Cardiff. Like it was just. It was That's insane. stressful. I, I can't yeah. even imagine. Like people listen to this. Yeah. It sounds un. Believable. Yeah. So that's a year after, right? So that so 2012, 20, how, how yeah. like 2013, mm. you get this thing that you've still got in now. Yeah. So how do you get to a point where you get back on the booze? So I come out of hospital a month after I wake up. I like because as soon the minute I woke up, I didn't want to be in a hospital for one more second. I'd seen death and destruction before, beyond what I could comprehend. I'd been in the worst two week nightmare that was never ending. And then I was in ITU for two weeks, which was horrendous. I was like, and you're coming off them drugs. Like I thought they were putting me in the kitchen for the night. Like my ex would come in and I'd say, they put me in the kitchen last night. Like, you know, like I was mad. Mind God. Yeah, I was just gone. Like, and I just wanted to get the, and I couldn't deal with being on opioids. I was just like, get me off. I just want paracetamol. Just get me off that. And they were like, we highly suggest you stay on some level of opioid, and I was like, paracetamol. Like, I don't care, I'll take the pain. I just want to stop feeling like this, like I feel. And that's what I did. They just would give me, um, through my, it's like they had these things coming out my neck, it's called a swan, and they would just put in, uh, intravenous, uh, um, uh, whatever the tap, paracetamol. So anyway, got out of there, uh, went home, and obviously now, half man, half machine, right? I got a, plug myself in i got to try and remember that these batteries only last eight hours and if i leave home make sure i take my spares bag with me right because if i don't change to my other spares i'm got 15 minutes where they'll beep there's the backup battery will last for 15 minutes and then after that the machine will stop and then what if it stops it depends whether my heart can take up the slack of the of the that the machine's taking off or whether it will just stop so there's the strong possibility that the heart would just then go into into failure. So then I could die. So, you know, these were like this real consequences of me not doing the, these things. But obviously, after a while, you know, like it's your whole life. You've never had to like think about carrying spare batteries to keep yourself alive, right? Obviously. So I did forget. You know, I've, I'd nip out home, go, and like obviously, as soon as my career ended, I went into coaching. So I went like my local club, and I go down there a couple nights a week and coach, because um, I was still not got over losing the game. And then I'd do the coaching, and then like a couple of times, my batteries would beep, and I think shit, my spares. I hadn't put them in the car, so I had to ring my my ex. <laughs> She'd have to drive from the house, which is only t thank God about ten minutes away, but. You know, with traffic. With your traffic lights and yeah, stuff, you're exactly. like, yeah. So she got there and there was like five minutes going on to let go on the machine. You know, oh, shitting yourself. She's shitting herself. Then she's angry. And rightly so, right? I mean, it's, it's life and death. And um, so it was stressful. It was a stressful time, mate, you know. And again, I hadn't addressed my career, my loss of my career. I lost my identity. I lost my uh, purpose when I lost the game as well as all those thoughts that never stopped going away, you know, that the regret, the shame, then everything that came with it, you know, like the way I behaved, that lack of value, integrity, all those things from uh, as, a, as a, a player that I, that I did that was morally wrong. <clears throat> and then later on then, just again, because now I had that operation. Had you, the were machine. Up, you were up and about. Yeah. Oh, no, my state of health returned much better than before. Not saying not much better, but... Bed, I still couldn't go running or, you know, you can't swim with this machine or anything like that. But I could walk without being completely out of breath, which was great. So obviously it brought, where that, it brought me a better value of life, the machine, it brought with it its own set of issues. Um, because now I was on the heart transplant waiting list, Jim. And that meant that I had to potentially have another operation. And I swear to God, the thought of going into hospital and into another anaesthetist room and into another theater, like would put me into a huge like anxiety and panic attacks. I just the thought of it, I just didn't think about it. Because if I did, I like although I knew I was on the heart transplant waiting list, I didn't like I didn't give it any time. I just thought like if if it happens, it'll happen. But I'm not like thinking about it. But that like next few months was just insane. 
because that's where I was mentally, just running away because there was just all the stuff from the past. There was no, I just couldn't see how the future would be at all be positive. Plus another few ops chucked in the bag. I didn't care. Like I just started to, I didn't know how to deal. But the mad thing was at the same time, I was super grateful to be alive after all that death and destruction in the hospital. I was, I was happy. I was happy to be here. You know, I was happy to have my kids, a house, uh, my wife, my friends, my family. I was, like, I was grateful. But at the same time, like, there was a lot of shit going on in my mind that I, did, I, could, I wasn't processing. But then at the same time, I wasn't asking for help. And my wife would say, Reese, you need to go and speak to someone. Like, you need, you need to go speak to a psychologist, a doctor, like someone. But I would just say, no, I'm fine. I'm all right. The same old tagline, yeah. I'm fine. You know, and I was fucking far from it. I was, I was in a dark place, like maximum dark. You know, and obviously now going through those operations, deeply traumatized. Uh, yeah, so you've got that PTSD thing. But just, just tr trooping on. I'll be okay. Um, you know, I'm a big old rugby player. I'll be fine. I've been through worse. And um, unfortunately, the only way, like. The, th the, th the incessant overthinking and that washing machine kind of, of head, I didn't know what else to do. And then between, once I started to, my, my health started to recover by about, so that op was 2014, September. By about, say, midway through 2015, I started to drink again. But like, just a couple of pints, because my heart was so, so fucked, and I was only allowed two and a half liters of any fluid a day. So that fluid was anything, water, coffee, alcohol, whatever you drank. They, it wasn't, you couldn't not drink booze. Yeah, they said that. But as long as I stayed within the two and a half liters. So at first it was a couple of pints, which was nice. It was like, oh, this is all right, you know? But like two and a half liters is four pints. Four and a half, well, five pints, whatever. So after about six months of drinking like that, you know, I started to get release from being, being able to drink again like an escape. Just took the edge off. Took the edge off. And then unfortunately between 2016 and 2019, like I kind of went, well, how much can I drink of alcohol? And, and they said again, as long as you stay within two and a half liters and you're fine. So I literally started drinking spirits, which was the beginning of the end really. Shh. And it started with, you know, I'd drink a bottle of gin and then, you know, I would, wouldn't, but then by towards the end, it was the two and a half liters of fluid was, was alcohol and um it wasn't like a, your brown paper bag alky you know i was more like a friday saturday sunday drinker maybe the odd thursday chucked in there but pre pre predominantly for those next three years mate that's what that's where it went i was uh every weekend you know as i on the back end of the weekends i'd have the most horrendous anxiety like thinking i was going to die so i just didn't even move i just played fifa all day um and then come come Wednesday, I'd start to feel better. Thursday, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I need a pint now. And then by the weekend, just absolutely blotto. You know? And then that's when it started to just get out of hand because I'd be that drunk that I would not know what I was doing. I'd be passed out sometimes. And I was still getting arrested with this machine, um, just being an arsehole. Um, you know, and the police would nick me and then, then I'd see the machines that I had and then they would just get me out of the, they didn't want me in the station then so then I found like wow like they can't even arrest me I got arrested at McDonald's drunk I was so drunk I was drunk drove and um, the police arrested me and I refused a roadside breath test they took me off uh, to the police station and then I said I need to go home my batteries are going to die and they um they had to get the nurse in, check me over, and she, you know, she said he needs to go right now. So they didn't breathalyze me. I got off it. But my wife was hoping that I was going to get locked up because this was this, this how it was. But I came home and I was fine, and I didn't get locked up again. So like this kind of created like a God complex. Do you know what I mean? Where I just thought I was untouchable. I was drink driving all the time. Things were bad, mate. Things were fucking bad. wild. Yeah. I had no idea about mm. that second part after that. Yeah, it was bad really bad and um you know do, going on stag do's i went on dom day stag do to i in, in ireland found i always ended up on my own though jim this was the maddest thing because you could go further 
I just would, and I, but I'd be so drunk, I'd just drift, and I'd do these things that were outrageous, and I'd get kicked out of clubs and be banned from there, and then go off and do your own and thing, and I'd just go on my own and just find myself in the most random places, doing like with just random human beings, and uh, obviously a long, a long way from anyone who knew what to do with these machines. So sometimes I'd, I, I mean, I'd put my hand through a taxi's window, cut my wrist in in Dublin. I'm on warfarin, in mind. It was pouring out of me like a like a Fuck tap. It hell, mate. I, and I had an operation in Dublin. Uh, my batteries were beeping when I was in the hot. As I got into A and E, I've literally got blood pouring out of my wrist. Like all I can remember was the noise. I can't. I was so drunk. I didn't know where my hotel was, um, and thank the guard had a- escorted me in. The police in 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 Ireland. And my battery started to beep, and I was trying to go leave the hospital, and they were restraining me because they said you're going to bleed out. But I said I need to go home. I got 15 minutes, and I knew I didn't have my batteries, my spares with me. And they said, "Where do you live?" And I said, "I don't know." <laughs> like, "Where's your hotel?" I didn't have any idea where the hotel, what hotel I was in. While well, I was being restrained, luckily the guard had found a, a hotel card in my pocket, and they literally blues and two to this hotel, got my spare batteries, um, and came back and. I was literally on the bed begging them. I was asking them to call um, my daughter because I wanted to ring her to, for my life because I was always going to die. And because my battery on this little white machine that I showed you, it counts down from 15 minutes when it starts to beep on the backup battery. Oh, my God. Yeah. So when I was looking at it, it was just going down, down. Obviously, I was waiting for the police. And when it got, it got to 25 seconds and they came busting through the door, oh, bro. I was just a mess, mate. It was such a fucking disaster. And obviously when my wife picked me up from the airport, I traveled through, how they let me fly, I'll never know. My jeans, I was wearing like bluish jeans. They were red, they were stiff. They could have stood on their own, bro. My shoes, I was wearing white shoes. My shoelaces were red. They let me fly like that somehow. I got up to Bristol airport and my wife picked me up and I had my hand in this big cast. And she was just like, she was done. That was the day she fell out of love with me. That was the exact day. I knew there and then. When the way she looked at me, I th- saw her through the windscreen. Done. She was done. But that was fucked. And then it all came to an end. 2019, I crashed my car drunk. And uh, luckily no one else was injured, nor myself. But I knew that night and the events that followed, like, things we needed to change. Like, I was fucked. M- Mrs. is gone. Uh, she was on her way out. Yeah, she she's... made she, how she had given me that many lives. I'll never know. Obviously, she was concerned. Like she was worried. Yeah, she didn't want to leave you because it she, could push you further. Well, I was going to die sooner or later, and she didn't want the kids to be have no dad. And uh, I was a mess. Like, and the fact it was t- it had taken a huge toll on the. You can imagine that for three years with that deck up of drinking and risk taking and regard disregard for my own life. Well, if the fact that you've even if you didn't have your bum bag with your batteries and everything with your heart, like anyone. Yeah. Exactly, right. Doing that, drinking that much. Exactly. I mean, genuinely, how I'm here today, Jim, is a fucking miracle. How are you here? How, how did you get help? How did that come about? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to ask this question first, and then you yeah. can tell me how that happened. Yeah. Where were the WRU? Where were the rugby, mm-hmm. hashtag rugby family? And it happened on their watch, <laughs> right? It happened yeah. at the Dragons. It happened... Yeah when you're contracted by the union, mm-hmm. and this isn't to call them out, this is just yeah. to highlight the fact that there are the stories like this, and I know one of my mates is yeah. really struggling at the minute. I won't say his name, but yeah. well, there's a few lads struggling, but one of them's really struggling. And I'm chatting to him and trying to get the right people to get around yeah. him. But yours, not even the mental aspect of it, the mm. physical aspect that you had a heart attack on their watch mm. and everything that goes with that. Where were they? And they clearly weren't there. So how did you get the support to be here today? Because you're looking well. Yeah. Like like now, I wouldn't say to yeah. look at you. No. You don't look like a bloke who's on the heart transplant <laughs> wait list. Do you know what I mean? You, you look yeah. fine. You look healthy. You look lean. Yeah. You're smiling. Yeah. A few grey whiskers, but I know. same. Yeah, it's good. Silver fox. But um, yeah, no, I mean, th- they were of no help. That was, that was also part of the demise, Jim, if I'm honest. You wanted them to reach out. Oh my God, I was desperate. You know, when my career ended, I was just waiting for the old rugby hashtag, rugby community ca- cavalry to come in and, you know, look after me and help me to get, you know, first of all, give me my career end in payment, which they didn't give me because they, they didn't have a, an insurance fit for purpose. 
So I didn't even get a career-ending injury payment from the WRU or well, rugby, uh, uh, regional rugby Wales, whoever hold the policy at that point, because they it was uh, wasn't fit for purpose. Um, but then obviously when I didn't get the payment, I was like, well, surely I'm still entitled to that money. It's ninety k. It's not like I'm not asking for millions. It's but that would have been enough with my critical illness to pay off my mortgage. Um, but they never did anything. And then I went. I went and asked questions to the WRU. Like, right, you had Roger Lewis at the time was the CEO. And like, it's a couple of months before, best mate, we're in the changing rooms with, you know, Prince William, uh, you know, winning the Grand Slam in our grits, kitchen up. All glory. Yeah. And then, you know, my heart attack happens. He lawyers up, lawyer either side of him. I'm with my cousin who's a, a lawyer and my, and my ex. And we're sat opposite him, and he won't make eye contact. It's all with business. Me. He won't make eye contact. Yeah. With me. And I'm like, bro, I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, come on, I just need some help here. Like, help me out. And he's like, it's not a problem. We don't hold the policy. Speak to someone else. Fuck. And I'm like, dude, this is fucking savage. I just wanted to get out of there. I couldn't deal with it. And then I left there. And then the regional rugby Wales just didn't want anything to do with it. And then I went to my players' association thinking, like, these were my backup. And then the WRPA was just an absolute shambles, mate. They offered me a refing course. I told you I couldn't even walk up the stairs. They came to my house and I said, we're not kidding, that's what they asked. Hey, you might be better <laughs> than some of the refs that are out there at the minute. <laughs> Do you know what no, I, mean? I couldn't even walk like 10 steps. Fucking hell. Oh, it was ridiculous. They offered you a refing course. Well, I mean, Fuck. I don't know how the, the Welsh RPA works, oh. but I interviewed Christian Day the other week on this show and he... Well, he, he didn't talk about it, but some of the players got in contact with the fact that they're funded by right. Premier Rugby or whatever. Maybe the same happens in Wales, that they're yeah. funded by the Welsh Union, I, so I effectively they're employed. Yeah. But Yeah, so they didn't reach out. No, they no, didn't no. want to know. Yeah, I found it really confusing, mate. You know, I found it really confusing. I felt isolated. I felt abandoned. And it made me really bitter, really resentful, really angry. And that, like, that piled on the self-pity of, of the end of career, loss of identity, loss of purpose. Um, all that trauma that I'd experienced where like, you know, none of them came to visit me in hospital or send me a letter or an email or get well soon message. None of that shit. Um, so it was just mad, bro. It was just the maddest time. And, uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And then obviously I ended, I mean, Got through those drinking years. It's miraculous, miracle. Like so the I car said. crash was the one when you had that. That was like, yeah. right. And then I stopped drinking because I knew my life was fucked at this point. I mean, my, my marriage was on the rocks. My kids had been dragged through an absolute disastrous three years experience. Um, Were you imagining your kids, right? Yeah. They're watching their dad, mm. the ultimate of the ultimate, playing for Wales. Mm. You know, the head of the family, he's yeah. wild man, but there's yeah. a cool aspect to that, you yeah. could say. like a and lovable rogue. And then they're watching the demise of the dad not only go through a heart attack, mm. but rocking through the house, fucking jeans with blood all over them, it's arm in a cast. Yeah. Fucking the batteries, you're mom, on your last batteries. Mum screaming at him constantly. And it's not her fault, it's my fault. Well, it's just the whole stress in the house, I imagine. Oh, it's yeah. just, just mental. Ten, cut the tension with a knife. You know, it's uh, unfortunately my children had to come uh, come through that, and I, I'm seeing a lot of that uh, the aftermath of that today. But I mean, I'll get to that in a minute. But I mean, yeah, it was awful, mate. Just the most dreadful experience of my life. It's just awful every way, emotion, phys emotionally, physically, mentally. Just it was the the worst experience ever. And the whole thing was that I was very very rarely was I ever present or conscious about my behaviour because it was just like a survival mechanism. I just was getting from the next one day to the next and refusing any help along the way. I didn't want it. And uh, like I said, being so, I was sober then from the 1st of September to 2019 after that car crash. And um, although I'd gone sober, I was cross-addicting. Um, I was just playing FIFA on my PS3. What does cross-addicting mean? So you found something else? Yeah, I started using cannabis drops. Um, I, I was using them to sleep at first, like with the THC and the CBD together, you know. So you just put the drops under your tongue. and I I, I was I justified, oh, they to help me sleep. But then I was using them from the minute I woke up. I was playing FIFA for like 10, you know, 8 to 10 hours a day. 
I'd wake up, just play on there all day. It was just crazy. Um, so you got an addiction problem is what this is coming well, around to. Yeah. Like obviously I didn't understand. I didn't understand what was happening, but like, I just couldn't understand why I was just stuck in this, like this constant state of mind. Like just constant shame, guilt, remorse, pain, emotional pain. Like I needed a release. How do I access this release? It used to be alcohol. Now what can it be? Then it was Scoring just like, a hat trick on FIFA. Yeah. <laughs> Building the best ultimate team you've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. I'm not drinking booze anymore, so I'm going to buy ultimate packs. Like is you know a hundred pounds worth because that's what I would have spent on the weekend on booze. Do you know what I mean? Like that kind of mental mindset and. Uh, I went on, a, one of my best friends from school invited me over uh, to Mauritius in the new year and said, come over. And this is 2020, before the pandemic? Just before, yeah. And he said, come and see me. Like, I'm so stoked. You got over through Christmas without having a drink. Come visit me. I'll pay for you and you and the family. By this time, my marriage is literally destroyed. It is obliterated. Um, didn't even sit on the same row in the same seats as my, my ex. Got there and then she just like offloaded to him. She was upset, like, you know, she was traumatized from this experience about what I'd been up to. And then my mates, with my other mates from school, uh, two of them and my dad and my half-brother basically chipped in and it staged an intervention, sent me to a rehab facility in Cape Town. Now, like, that was in itself was tough because he told me on the last night of my holiday in Mauritius, where he's where he lives, and uh, like, I didn't want, I didn't want to go, mate. I didn't think I was that bad. Like my denial was. Were you drinking at that point or not? No, no. Okay, so and it was I was given. So, you know, yeah. I, I was like, I, I mean, I haven't had a drink for five months. Like, do you know what I mean? But my life was fucked. And um, he said, "You're going, but we paid." So that morning, the next morning, my wife and uh, my ex-wife and my kids had to. Fl they went to the airport, and my kids were like, you know, they were like, "Dad's fine. He promises he won't do this." And it was so sad. And they like waved me off, and. Um, and then the, the next day I flew to Cape Town and that's where I went to a rehab facility there called Stepping Stones. And um, I was there for 28 days mate. and it was genuinely the, it changed my life. Yeah. The next 28 days in that facility, I changed what I knew about myself. I addressed so many of my issues. You know, I learned more about myself in those 28 days than I had in 37 years, mate. Simple as that. It was just the most insane, painful, profound, liberating, transformational experience, like all in one. It was incredible. It was an incredible experience. Mm. Imagine, it obviously didn't happen, but the timing of it before the pandemic, mm. as you didn't have that before, when you were sat at home like we all were. Oh, things would have got bad, bro. Yeah. Real bad. Yeah. So you go there, that's from when we record now, two years ago, nearly three? Yeah, so yeah, it's first as, yeah. of February 2020, yeah, yeah. rehab. I was there for, for a month. And, and then after that, I all fixed or is it, was there a load of work on? Uh, I know the answer so, to this. But, so much work, mate, so much But so you much weren't, work. but it gave you tools? Yeah, like it was just, in, in, that, in that, you know, being in that environment, you know, complete strangers, um, it was a humbling experience, Jim. Right? All addicts. Of every description, crystal meth, crack, heroin, cocaine, opioids, gambling, sex, you name it, right? They're all in there. And you, you're you rooming up with people. And I got, I, my, my one set of roommates was a heroin addict, an op, uh, opioid addict, and an alcoholic. And the, the heroin addict was literally scratching his skin off in his sleep. And I, I was just like, oh, my God, this is surreal. And then all day we were just in intensive group and one-to-one -one therapy sessions. But mate, this it was an inc it was an unbelievable experience because what I learned like almost straight off the bat was that we were just all human beings for a start, and no matter what age, race, sex, or creed we were, we were just all human beings, but just suffering from one trauma or another, and dealing with things the best way we knew how. Like, and I, that that lesson and and the deeper understanding that, you know, like alcohol wasn't the problem, like I was the problem. And alcohol made my problem a lot worse. So, like, through these understandings and that greater self-awareness, like, why I was acting the way I was acting, why I why I felt like I felt and started to deep, like, dig deep into my psyche, like, and, and, and started to access parts of, w of why I was like that. You know, fear, 
how like fear had impacted me for my whole life from a young lad, which was um, really insightful. And then from that point, just diving into the, the big question, Jim, which was like, who the fuck am I? You know, I'm 37 years old. My life is an absolute mess. My health is fucked. Like, I've, how I'm alive is a, a genuine miracle. I should have been dead 50 times over, but I'm still here. Like, who am I, actually? And it was from that point and through that surrender and acceptance in the house that allowed me to start to cre create change and growth. And that's when things really started to, to happen. Like, it was just magical because, like, that suffering that I experienced in that house... And by being able to start to accept like my life situation and my health, the fact that I was fucked, um, the fact that I couldn't do anything to change it, that I could only just start again. But like the main part, the main ingredient was surrender. I had to surrender like my pride and ego because my whole life, my adult life, it had been so helpful, right? Like it helped me in my career, but also being the demise of my career at times, narcissistic at times, especially whilst intoxicated. But then all of a sudden, when I just thought, right, like, I'm just going to let it go. And it was a trust factor. So I had to surrender my pride and ego, but then trust, like, I have to believe, like, I need help from someone else other than Reese right now. And I was like, I am willing to, like, I'll beg for it, for anyone. I, I'm so desperate for change. And desperation was an incredible tool. So I used that. I used it as a tool, as it, as it was. And it kind of woke me up. It, it, it awakened me. Because I would literally pray every morning, every night, like sometimes like five, like 20, 30, 40, 50 times in a day. And I'd pray to like Allah, Buddha, you know, anyone, like anyone who would help. God. I just was like, please, like help me. You know, I can't live like this any for one more second. And that's what happened, right? Like suddenly I woke up. I, I, I was awakened. I, I was... I left that house a completely different human being, a different perspective. Like my mindset changed pretty much overnight. Like that victim mindset that I had carried with me from the end of my career, that like pity, self-pity, like poor old Reese, you know, why me? Like that just went. It was like offloaded. And then I just, my mindset just changed from that point on and it was just like huge growth. There was a lot of work to be done. My family relationship was a complete, complete disaster. I had to go home and try and and mend that, which was, it didn't happen, unfortunately, not certainly not with my wife. Um, and there were some deeply ingrained behaviours that weren't going to change overnight, Jim, as well, which led to a lot of problems with my wife when I came out the house. So, yeah, it was, it was tough. But those next few months, bro, I mean, I put a lot of time in. You know, I did work. I did the AA. I did the 12 Steps of Recovery with a sponsor which was um, amazing, gave me like a moral compass. Um, you know, the work I did with him was, it helped me a lot for sure. But then I almost found then that like 12 steps became a bit of a crutch. If I didn't go to three meetings a week, I felt like, you know, I felt like... Edgy. Edgy, like something wasn't right. So you've got that addictive personality then, haven't you? That well, is yeah, you, but which then, a lot of people have. It is, but... After that, then I was like, right, what else can, like, this can't be normal. This feeling can't be right. And by this point, like, bro, I was completely different. You know, I was experiencing life from a different place. Like, my gratitude, my awareness, my presence. I was conscious, you know, like, colors looked different. My diet changed literally overnight. Things tasted different. Um, I started to journal uh, write gratitude lists, go for regular walks, like things started to change, right? And then, but I was like, right, I need to change, but I wanted to like fix myself, not in, like not service level, like I need to deep dive here, like how am I going to fix? Because there's obviously something deeply entrenched in me that makes me feel like and brings up these feelings and behaviors, especially those limiting beliefs that I was there were like negative thinking patterns. So that's when I just deep dive, right? I looked for any treatment. Anyone that could help me try and access these thoughts, these traumas that I didn't understand at the time were trauma. And that, like trauma is a big word, right? It comes in different guises. There's big trauma, small trauma. Like, but for me, it was a lot of it was from my childhood, and um, it was a it was a deeper understanding of what had happened to me through those years, 
and I used a psychologist. I used ad- addiction psychologists. The, the the big moment for me was a neuro linguistic programmer. The work I did with Dr. Phil Parker, his name is amazing man from Brighton. Shout out Dr. Yeah, Phil. Dr. Phil, legend, incredible bloke, literally life changer. Uh, the work I did with that man in those six sessions was was incredible, genuinely. Um, and but I was open minded, right? And I, I equine therapy. Uh, brain spotting, EM, EMDR, MPR, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I was trying anything. And then through this process of like, but being in healthier environments, around better people, uh, healthier people, you know, I was trying to in, uh, get away from the old lifestyle of pubs, clubs, nightclubs, rugby clubs, into this new world of, and then I found breath work, mate. And like breath work's been incredible for me. It's been a gift. Um, to access, you know, subconscious, emotional stored energies that I hadn't uh, processed, hadn't integrated. Um, and that's been amazing for me. It's been a great tool, bro. So all of that together just allowed me to be an overall better human being and to start to deal with my traumas at root cause because I believe that there was a lot behind the way that I, it was, you know, generational trauma as well because it's, you know, that subconscious uploaded behavior from my dad and my dad learned from his dad and it gets passed down, dun, 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 you know. And I think you look at it now, that, and do you know, have you ever listened to a work by a guy called Gabor Mate? No. Like he talks about um, trauma, mate, and it's just the most mind-blowing stuff because the guy is just so on point. He's an addict, Israeli, and uh, ex-addict, so I say. And what his work on trauma is just mind-blowing. And it's proof that, you know, that our DNA, you know, we say, oh, it's in the family. It runs in the family. Like he's, oh, you know, big drinker or whatever. It's just that DNA is it's imprinted trauma. And we know now through epigenetics that can be changed, right? Like Joe, Dr. Joe Dispenza does it. So, but it, it's environmental. It's, it's a lot of work. I think the lot of work is the thing and, and yeah. the possibilities. Like your story is absolutely amazing, man. Like from where we went, at the beginning of the conversation <laughs> to putting your hand through taxis, you're bleeding out in a yeah. hospital in Dublin to then be talking yeah. about breath work. And mm. I know it's not as simple as that. I'm actually reading a really good book at the minute. Matthew Perry, Chandler yeah. from Friends. Oh, okay. And he talks about childhood trauma. Yeah. And it shows itself in different ways. Mm. His mum had him when he was, when she was 21. And mm. I don't know whether she was drinking and these stuff. I haven't gone deep enough into the book yet. But yeah. Everyone's on a different path and everyone yeah. has different issues and it's not all glory mm. at all. Like people look at me and think, oh, he's just a podcast now or he's doing this, he's transitioned out of the game. I've got fucking demons. Mm. And I find myself in a position now as a dad of four for self-improvement, for talking and having these conversations, being inspired by different people, you know, learning. And it is so out of the comfort zone, like, excuse the phrase, if we did this when we were 25, 26, you'd be called a fanny, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. In the environment that you were in, oh, the yeah. alpha, Absolutely. like we were the same generation. Yeah. But what the fuck are you talking about, bro? Breath like, work. what are you doing? Shut up, mate. Yeah, like meditation. <laughs> like, I'm going to pray to Allah, Buddha, and bloody <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Like, yeah, it was just, it's it has changed, but also mm. the conversation and having you in here today yeah. to outline your story to where you are now. People will be listening to this, and I say mm. that because I know the demographic of the rugby pod that me and Goody do. Yeah. It is that demographic of males between the age of 25 and 45. Mm. There'll be a few of you older, established gentlemen and ladies out there. But that vulnerable age where there's so many different influences, so many different pressures. I know a lot of people work in the city who listen to this and yeah. I'm sure they're going wild on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday, Monday. If they've gone too wild, they'll do it again. Yeah. And to hear someone like you... Because there isn't just the one story. Oh, I like alcohol. I'll drink a couple of bottles of gin. Mate, you need a fucking new heart. Mm. On top of that as well. Like you've lost your career. Your wife. Along the way. Yeah. And I think that intervention, whether you thought you needed it or not, Mm. is so important, isn't it? Like, as in, because... Life-saving. Seriously. Because the alpha in you, or in us... You're in denial. Nah, I don't. I'm tough enough to get through this. I can do it myself. Yeah. How are you feeling? I'm all right. I'm all right. Yeah. But that 
external support is so, yeah, so important. Massively. And then people listen to this as well. There are many things out there. Like you're, you've gone down a proper line of mm. self development. Yeah. The fact that you're doing breath work. You know, you you you're talking about these different doctors and that you're seeing. What was it? Equine. Yeah, I, in rehab we worked with horses. There you go. It's amazing, bro. Seriously. So that, like this is proper stuff, but people yeah. listening to this might just want something just, and that's why this one I've partnered with Movember yeah. because I look at what they do. They're cool, yeah. you know. But actually, fucking, what does cool mean? You actually look at what they do mm. and the way in which they help support lads that are in our kind of age category of yeah. danger mm. when it comes to the mental health things. But your story is crazy. Mm. Crazy. <laughs> When's the heart transplant? How does that happen? How do you get a heart transplant? I mean, the vulgarities of it, you're waiting for someone to fucking die, right? Yeah. And how does that unfold? Like, you, you know, like it's a difficult one and a difficult thing to speak about. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd, um, yeah obviously someone needs to die. And, um, but I've been on the list on and off for eight years. So since 2012, um, but then, sorry, since 2014, but you know, I came off at different times when I obviously wasn't in the right place mentally and drinking and all that. Would they take you off if they know you were drinking or not? Oh yeah. And obviously I, I've told them all what I, how, how bad things were. And they obviously say, well, if you start to drink again, we're going to have to take you off the list this time. And I was like, yeah, fine. But I've been sober over three years now, so it's fine. But um, and I have no intention of touching the drink. I can assure you. But um, yeah, so f the last three years since since I've been uh, clean, I haven't. Uh, I've been on the list nonstop. But the way that the list works in the UK is is weird. So it's a three tier list. So there's a transplant list at the bottom. Then there's a. Um, uh, urgent list and then there's a super urgent so it's a three tier list and you only go up the list the sicker you get so it doesn't matter how long you've been on there What you, there's not like a number um, so I'm on the bottom list and I have been so like the chance they, they this is what they tell me the likelihood of me having a heart transplant on that l list is less than 1% so in the three years I've been on there solid for the last three years I've had one phone call um and that was about three months ago. And I had the call. I was working in a school because I helped to form a uh, mental health and wellbeing charity. And uh, I, I was doing a talk with them. And I got the call from the hospital. I was like, obviously, in shock. Couldn't believe that I got the call because they told me that wasn't possible. I had a little cry. I had a little cut with my, with my business partner. And um, jumped in the car, started to drive home, rang my ex, rang my partner. And as I got home in, the, the surgeon rang me and said, I'll stand down, the guy's uh, dying because of the type of donor he was. Um, and that, but it's, I wouldn't have had time to drive to Birmingham for them to prep me for op to remove my organ, which would take at least four or five hours because of the scar tissue. And that organ would have been sat there for too long. So it wouldn't have been uh, good practice, basically. So like all within half an hour, I had the call and then they canceled it. So that was, that was, but it was fine. I mean, you don't want the wrong heart, do you, Jim? Do you know what I mean? So I didn't dwell on it or anything like that. Fuck. Yeah. Isn't it crazy life where you're crying? Yeah. Tears of happiness because you're about to get another human being's heart yeah. whose family are going to be crying Literally. and hy hysterical because they're about to lose mm, someone in their family. Yeah, I often think about it. I talk to my body. I'm trying to allow my body to accept the different organ and I pray for the person who's going to give me his heart or allow me. To Does it need to be a man? Yes. Yeah, I have to have a man. Because um, it's like shoe sizes. I didn't understand, really. You know, like The bigger you are, the taller you are, especially the bigger your heart will be. Like anyone under six foot, I think they can still have a, a woman's heart because I'm like on the six foot threshold and I'm, I'm not I'm not heavy I'm like 15 and a half stone now I've leaned up certainly wouldn't be a prop anymore mate and how will it take do you not know that until it happens what's the percentage rate yeah I mean it's pretty good right um, it will be my third open heart surgery it will be um, I have a lot of scar tissue under my heart under my sternum sorry so 
getting the the organ my heart out will probably be the most challenging part of the of the procedure just obviously with the risk of ble of bleeding stuff but fingers crossed as long as i get that out then and, and and i get a good ticker i get a good uh a good donor then uh all good and uh, as long as i get year one i get at least minimum 10 years from there so i mean i don't know the actual statistics of survival rate but i think they're pretty good but I mean, I don't, I really don't dwell on it, Jim. You know, like I just try and be as present as possible, as much as possible. You know, and a lot of the routines that I have in my in my life right now are about trying to make me more present, um, because it just is a much better way to live. <laughs> you know, and I can appreciate my children, my life, and materialistically, no matter how much or how little I have, it doesn't really matter, because I can just be here, you know, and I don't have to think about. The material part of life and um i wish i'd lived like that my whole life really if i'm honest because it would, things would have been a hell of a lot better but uh it is what it is and you know i'm grateful for my journey bro i mean that you know i'm i'm, I'm genuinely grateful for my heart attacks like i i'm grateful for the the highs but my lows my my, my worst lows are what created the man i am today and um for that i am genuinely grateful because it's been a blessing. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for you sharing that story. And I've said wild a few times. People are going to be listening <laughs> to this who've got no fucking idea what's happened literally under the bonnet. So what you're doing now as well, like people be listening to this might want to reach out to you and be like, how do I get this bloke in to come and inspire yeah. people and, and talk to people, you know, being yeah. present's the biggest thing. We all talk about it. Mm. You know, Ed Slater. My mate who's got MND, yeah. he spoke about being present. You know, I had mm. Tom and Ben Young's in here. They were talking about gratitude mm. and these different things that go with life and what everyone's looking for. They're, they're things that we're looking for, unless you've yeah. had a, an experience like yourself and you've been through mm. stuff that a lot of people haven't. But some people are going through that mentally. Yeah, It's powerful. So how do people powerful. get in contact with you? And what, what else are you doing? You mentioned, you, you briefly yeah. touched on the mental health advocacy you're doing? Yeah, so um, I do, you know, after my experiences in the house, in the rehab, I just came out and I felt I wanted to share my story. That's what I felt called to do. It was my, I felt like it was my new purpose, really. So that's what I did. You know, I started, I became an inspirational speaker, I suppose, um, and also started a mental health and wellbeing charity in South Wales called Tidy Butt. And, um, yeah, so, if, I mean, I do talks all the time, so corporates, small big business, sports clubs, schools, colleges, universities, you name it. So, um, best probably place to find me is either on LinkedIn or, um, you know, my website's www.realreesthomas.com uh, or Insta, you hit me up, Reese underscore Thomas 33, I think. That's why I couldn't find you. I'm not, I've not, I spoke your name wrong as well. Uh, so yeah. yours is R. H, H yeah, yeah, Y, yeah. S. Welsh way, the Welsh way. It's the Welsh way. Has it always been that way or not? Yeah, I used to think I was real special in South Africa. I, was the, <laughs> I only met one other Reese my whole life. And then my first rugby team in Wales, in Newport, I had about six six Reeses and one was Reese Thomas as well. So <laughs> That's class, mate. Mate, absolutely love that. We could have spoke for ages and I really appreciate you sharing that story. I'm going to say it one last time. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Jim.